بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to class number six of الشمائل المحمدية where in this class inshallah we will be covering three chapters chapter number one will be the difficult living conditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam focusing particularly on what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to eat Chapter number two will be dealing with the leather socks of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam known as Al Khuf. And then chapter number three will be dealing with the leather sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So those are the three chapters we're hoping to cover. Bidnillahi Ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and make it easy for us. So let us begin. We are now at chapter number nine for those of you that are following along. And again for today we will be using this book, inshaAllah. Um, to read the hadith and give some basic explanation. قال المؤلف رحمنا الله وإياه باب ما جاء في عيش رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Chapter number nine, the reports pertaining to the living conditions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So now the first thing we're going to be highlighting is that even though in chapter number nine he speaks about the living conditions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and what he used to eat in particular. You'll notice that towards the ending of the book, there is a similar chapter as well. So we want to discuss why are there two separate chapters about the living conditions of the Prophet ﷺ and what he used to eat. And the scholars mention two uh, main reasons. Number one is that in this early chapter, it is speaking about the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. Whereas in the latter chapter, it's going to be covering the Prophet ﷺ and his family. And then also in this chapter, it's about the Prophet ﷺ early on, and then the latter chapter is closer to the time of the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So that is the distinguishing uh, point between the early chapter on what he used to eat and his living conditions versus the latter chapter, uh, which is going to be closer to the ending of his life ﷺ. So we're now at hadith number 71 for those of you that are following along. Muhammad ibn Sirin narrated, we were with Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu while he was wearing two linen garments dyed with red clay. He cleaned his nose with his garment upon which he said, well done, well done. Abu Huraira is cleaning his nose with linen. There came a time when I would fall unconscious between the pulpit of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Aisha radiallahu anha's dwelling, whereupon a passerby would come and put his foot on my neck thinking I suffer from epilepsy, while in fact I suffered nothing but hunger. So in this narration from uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, who is one of the imams of the tabi'een, one of the imams of the second generation, and Allahu Akbar, you can imagine this beautiful gathering where you have one of the imams of the tabi'een sitting with one of the sahaba radiallahu anhum, the likes of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And it's amazing on how they're learning from him. So here, uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, He's wearing some very nice clothing right now. So he's wearing linen clothing, which is considered somewhat luxurious. And his nose is running at that time. So he takes one of his, cloth, his cloth from his from what he's wearing and he rubs his nose with it. And he's amazed and he's just reflecting on his life that there was a time in his life where he was so poor that he couldn't even afford food, that he would have epileptic seizures and he would start shaking on the ground due to how hungry he was. And here he was now, you know, wiping his nose with the softest of cloth that was available. So he was remarking that how difficult things were early on for him, yet eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, provided him more. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided him more. And there's so many reflections on this subhanAllah. That when you look at the life of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he narrates that how was Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu able to narrate so many hadith? that he lived with the Prophet Sallallahu for approximately three years when you have the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar that had spent, you know, decades with him. Yet they did not narrate as much. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he speaks about himself as reported in Sahih al-Bukhari that while the muhajirun, those that uh, migrated to Medina were busy with their business transactions and the Ansar were busy with their farming, I was busy following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he intentionally chose a life of poverty and a life of difficulty 
um, to gather the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu So wherever he would go, he would follow him. Anytime revelation come down, he would question the Prophet Sallallahu just to learn from him. So he made those sacrifices. And that sacrifice, Allahu Akbar, look at the impact and effect that it's had that not a single collection of hadith is presented today except that you see the name of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu due to the sacrifices that he made. So much so that he would not eat for days at a time. That he would not eat for days at a time that he would pass out and have those epileptic seizures due to hunger. Now if you look up this same hadith inside Sahih al-Bukhari, there's um, a longer version that says that one of those days Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered him uh, to host him. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes into his house and he asks Aisha radiallahu anha, do we have anything to offer our guests? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived at such a, a minimalist lifestyle of eating and drinking that he didn't know what was inside of his house. And thus he asks Aisha radiallahu anha and she says, that we were presented with a cauldron of milk, that someone gave us a pot of milk, that is what we can offer our guests. And the Prophet Sallallahu took that cauldron of milk and he shared it amongst Ahl al-Sufa, all of the poor companions that lived in the masjid. And it's a beautiful story that's worth looking up because there's some beautiful lessons in it. But this shows us that the Prophet Sallallahu lived such a minimalist lifestyle that not one, he didn't know what was inside his own house. And then number two, you know, he had a pot of milk that Allahu Akbar, you could imagine, that he could have saved for a later time, but he wanted to share it with the poor companions. He wanted to share it with the poor companions and make them feel as if they were not alone in their hunger uh, or in their poverty. So that's what we learn from this hadith. Hadith number 72. Malik ibn Dinar narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never reached the state of being satisfactory full, neither from bread nor from meat, except when he used to eat with people, except when he used to eat with people. The scholars mention, and this ties into other hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks about, that when you eat, you should eat one third food, one third of liquid, and then one third for breathing and leaving it for air. That is the uh, maximum that you should reach. Uh, or other than that, you should just eat enough to keep your back straight. You should just keep eat enough to keep your back straight. So this hadith in particular is speaking about that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was by himself, he never went beyond that. And in fact, he would only eat enough to keep his back straight. However, if he was invited to someone's house, then he would eat up to two thirds. He would eat up to two thirds. And when it says that satisfactory full, this wasn't full completely, but this was two thirds uh, full. And this is what the scholars mention from them, uh, Al-Bajuri and from them, Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Abbad uh, and others as well. And this is how much the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would uh, satisfy himself, up to a maximum of two-thirds. Now here's a, an interesting question for all of you to reflect upon, that why is it that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is by himself, he's eating very, very little food, enough just to keep his back straight, yet when he's invited to someone's house, he's eating enough to fill two-thirds of his stomach. Why is that the case? Think about that for a second. That he's by himself, he's eating very little, yet when he's invited to someone's house or to, to someone's meal, then the Prophet ﷺ is eating up to two-thirds. And this shows us the level of consideration the Prophet ﷺ had for other people's feelings. That you only invite someone to your house if you genuinely love them and genuinely care for them. And the Prophet ﷺ understood that and he knew how happy it would make the people if the Prophet ﷺ ate from it and not even just tasted the food, but ate uh, a decent portion size. Shahnaz, Jazakallah khair, thank you so much. That is a great answer, to respect the host. And that is that, not only just respect, but to return that love and to turn um, that appreciation and show that appreciation to the, the host that I appreciate the food. So it's not just trying it, but it's eating a decent portion to make them happy. It is eating a decent portion to make them happy. And this is to show that uh, he loved the people and that he loves the food that has been presented to him. Bint Yasin, Jazakallah khair, great answer as well. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he shares a, a point of benefit that I want to share with you. He says, a perfection of gathering of food will have four elements to it. A perfection of gathering of food will have four elements to it. Number one, what is eaten is halal. So what is presented to you is halal. Number two, is that you say Bismillah before you eat. Number three, you say Alhamdulillah 
when you finish. And then number four, there are many hands that share the food. There are many hands that share the food. Now, obviously, this is speaking outside of a, a, a pandemic situation. It's not speaking about in the pandemic where, you know, unless you're living in the same household, it's discouraged um, to eat from the, the same food of, of others right now. So obviously, do keep that in mind. Obviously, uh, I don't think I need to emphasize that, but please do look after yourselves and take the, the means and precautionary measures that you need to protect yourself and your family. So here, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said that those gatherings will attain perfection if four things are done. That number one, the food is halal. Number two, Bismillah is said when, before you eat. Number three, you say Alhamdulillah when you're finished. And number four, that there are many hands that touch the food and share in the food. And if I was to add uh, a fifth, that uh, a dua be made for the host, a dua be made for the host, that it is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that you make dua for the host to say that, O oh Allah, feed those that have fed us and give drink that do those that have given us drink and forgive them and increase them in their risk and increase them in their risk. This was one of the duas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would uh, make for, for the host. And if someone uh, offered food to break his fast, he would make a dua that, O oh Allah, may uh, those that who are fasting break their, their fast with your food. Um, and uh, you may the angels be, uh, you know, guests in, in, in your presence um, and, and the likes of that. You know, it's a very rough translation. So the Prophet ﷺ would make dua for even the ones that gave him food to break his fast with. So we should be making dua for our hosts when they provide us with food. And this brings us to chapter number 10. But before we move on, so what we wanted to highlight from this is the minimalist, minimalist lifestyle that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived uh, and the poverty that he faced and that he shared with his companions عنهم, in that poverty, that he did not live a luxurious, pompous lifestyle, but rather it was one of simplicity and one of minimalism uh, and one that was quite difficult, subhanAllah. It was quite difficult um, that what the Prophet ﷺ went through in terms of that lifestyle. Chapter number 10, Babu ma ja'a fi khufi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa The reports pertaining to the khuf of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So the khuf is referring to leather socks that cover the whole entire foot beyond the ankle. So there are socks that cover the whole entire foot um, up to beyond the ankle. This is known as a khuf. And we begin with hadith number 73. Burayda radiallahu anhu narrated that an Najashi sent two plain black colored khufs as a gift to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As soon as he received them, he tried them on, performed ablution, and then wiped over them. And then wiped over them. So let us look at the lessons we derive from this. Number one, at that time, an Najashi was uh, a non-Muslim. So this is before an Najashi accepted Islam. And he gave this gift to the Prophet Sallallahu So this shows us the uh, permissibility of accepting gifts from non-Muslims. Number two, a second fiqh lesson in this is that the Prophet Sallallahu is showing us Al-Aslu fil Ashiya al tuhur that the foundational principle with regarding uh, items of, 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 of anything is that they are pure until proven otherwise. So the Prophet Sallallahu didn't wash the khuf that Al-Najashi gave him even though that they're coming from a non-Muslim but the presumption is that if you don't see anything on it and you don't smell anything on it then it is considered pure. It is considered pure and you treat it as pure. Number three, what we derive from a fiqh perspective is that leather socks can be wiped over. Leather socks can be wiped over. And from the fiqh of wiping over leather socks is that if you have made wudu already and you have worn uh, and you put your socks on after that, then the next time when you make wudu, you are allowed wiping over the top of your sock. You're allowed wiping the top of your sock. And this needs to be understood that, just let me put my bookmarker in place, that if this is your foot that's wearing the sock, when you do mas on your sock, you're wiping like this. You're wiping like this. And that is just once. And it's not the bottom of the sock that needs to be washed, but rather it is just the top that has a wiping over it, that has a wiping over it. And that is what the Prophet ﷺ shows us. In the uh, Hanafi, Shafi'i, and Hanbali Madhab, a resident can wipe over their sock for a period of 24 hours, and one that is traveling can wipe over their sock for 72 hours. 
In the Maliki Madhab, there is no limit. In the Maliki Madhab, there is no limit as to how long you can wipe over your sock. Now, what if a sock is not leather? Are you still allowed wiping over it? The vast majority of scholars have said no. The vast majority of scholars have said no. And their reasoning is that the sock that fulfills the requirements of wiping over needs to be one that cannot be penetrated by water. It should not be uh, easily uh, puncturing, meaning the socks that we wear today, you know, if you walk over a few stones, they'll easily cut through and uh, make holes in, in, in the socks. So uh, it shouldn't be uh, water penetrable, nor should it be easily uh, puncturable. So based upon that, uh, the majority of scholars did not allow the wiping over modern socks. Did not allow the wiping over modern socks. However, you do have a minority of group of scholars, and this is the opinion um, that I lean towards as well, that if you're wearing uh, sports socks that are relatively on the thicker side uh, and they cover the ankle, um, then in that situation, as long as there's no major holes or so, you can wipe over them and inshallah it is acceptable as well with the same condition that you have put them on while in a state of wudu, that you have put them on while in a state of wudu. And this is what we see from the Prophet wasallam. these three points of fiqh. And the fourth point is that these socks were black. So if you remember from yesterday's dars, the Prophet wasallam generally preferred lighter colors like white, and green, and that which was dyed uh, with saffron, uh, but didn't have any saffron remaining on it. So those lighter colors. Yet for footwear, the Prophet wasallam did not, not apply uh, the same standard. And whatever was given to him, he would wear. And obviously, because it is usually made of an animal skin, it will be on the darker side. It will be on the darker side. And the Prophet wasallam was fine with that. He was fine with that. Hadith number 74. Al-Mughir ibn Shu'ba narrated, Dihya gifted the Prophet wasallam with a pair of hoofs that he wore right away and he kept wearing them until they became torn. The Prophet wasallam did not know whether the skin of the hoof was from an animal that was slaughtered properly or not. So multiple lessons here. We focused on the fiqh in the previous hadith. Now we're going to speak more about the etiquette of the Prophet wasallam. And from the etiquette of the Prophet is that if he was given a gift, he would wear it right away. And this was to bring happiness to the one that is gifting him the gift to, uh, to please them uh, and to show that the Prophet appreciated the gift that was given to him. Number two is that the Prophet maximized the utility of the gift that was given to him. So he continued wearing these socks until they became torn, until they became torn. So it was not just a... Uh, a formality of pleasing the one that gave him the gift, but the Prophet ﷺ also maximized the utility that he continued to wear these leather socks until they became torn, until they became torn. So you should maximize the utility of all of your clothing uh, that continue to wear it as long as it fits and as long as it doesn't get torn, then continue to wear it and maximize its utility. And then we have a point of fiqh over here as well, that the Prophet ﷺ did not know if the animal from which the leather was extracted from actually had the biha done to it or not. Why is this important? Because generally speaking, the scholars have said that the skin only becomes permissible if the animal is uh, from that which can be uh, eaten and also if it is slaughtered properly. If the animal is not slaughtered properly, then that skin is not permissible for us and needs to be dyed, or not dyed, but needs to be tanned, needs to be tanned. So here the Prophet wasallam did not inquire about it, and this shows us again from the etiquettes of the Prophet wasallam is that when someone gives you something, you do not ask if it is halal or not. Uh, and this is particularly if it's coming from a Muslim. If a Muslim is giving you something, you do not ask if it is halal or not. And this is when the Prophet wasallam received this gift from Dahiya, that is why he did not ask if it is from an animal that was slaughtered properly or not, but rather you honor the people that give you gifts and have the presumption that it is halal. Same thing with the hadith of An-Najashi, that we see that An-Najashi gave it, and the Prophet ﷺ did not inquire what animal it was from or if it was uh, cleansed or not, 
but rather these principles help us establish that it is halal until proven haram. And that is the way we treat the matters of this dunya, that they are halal until proven haram. So this is the chapter of the leather socks of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which brings us to chapter number 11, which is Babu ma ja'a fi na'li Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the reports pertaining to the sandals of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, what needs to be understood is that while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did wear sandals, it is not our understanding of this matter of food covering and, and you know, that which we use to, to cover our feet and to, uh, for uh, the function of, of, of day to day life is not restricted to sandals. So one should not say, think that wearing sandals is from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but rather this was custom of the people during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore sandals. So you are allowed to wear any type of shoe uh, or any type of footwear that you like. And uh, it is not particularly sunnah to wear um, sandals within and of itself. Now, with that being said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seen walking in four different types of foot footwear. In reality, it's three and one is barefoot. So let's go through them. Number one, Al-Bajuri reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would wear footwear that was narrow in the middle. So it's wide and then it becomes very narrow um, in, uh, in the middle of, of, of the shoe. Uh, so wide and then narrow and then wide. So you can imagine what the shape of that is going to be like. And that is like the modern day, you know, the, the sandala sign that they have. Uh, you see this on a lot of clothing and uh, a lot of like books that try to uh, remember or commemorate rather the, the sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two, that he wore sandals that had straps on the back. So on the back where his ankle is, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have footwear that there's a strap on the back to give the ankle support. So this was to show that not only were there straps on the front of the shoe, but also straps on the back to give the ankle support. Number three is that um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would wear sandals that have partitions in them. So they have something called toe straps that would separate between the toes. And then number four, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was known to walk barefoot as well. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was known to walk barefoot as well. And this was narrated that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go to visit someone that was sick or someone that was ill, he would walk barefoot towards them. He would walk barefoot towards them. And this was from his humility that uh, he would do so. So there's no particular virtue of walking barefoot to within of itself, but out of his humility, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would walk barefoot. Now, if you live by a beach and you're able to, you know, walk in the sand barefoot, then yes, there are, you know, medicinal reasons that one can benefit from uh, by doing so. And I'm assuming in the, in the desert as well, that walking in that sand can also have uh, medicinal benefits um, to the dexterity of your foot and, you know, its uh, strength and so on. Uh, but outside of that, you know, if in the modern day world where everything is concrete and cement, um, and you know, you can find nails and glass, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all, you should uh, proceed with precaution and not assume that one should walk barefoot. Um, you'll also find that there's a tradition among some Muslims that when they go to Medina, they walk barefoot. This was not something that was known amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but if one does it out of love, then the uh, criticism is decreased, right? The one wants to be like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and show respect to the area where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions walked, then you can understand where this position is coming from as it's done out of love and sincerity. But again, this wasn't something that was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a regular basis or by his companions radiallahu anhum. Rather, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was known to walk with his sandals. So those are the four different types of footwear uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was known to have worn. So now we get to hadith number 75. Qatada radiallahu anhu uh, or uh, Qatada rahimahullah from the Tabi'in, he narrated, I asked Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu to describe the sandals of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He replied, each sandal had two qibalan, meaning that they had um, two things that attached the soul together, two things 
that attached the soul together. And Anas radiallahu anhu, he actually kept the sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa after his death. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Anas radiallahu anhu, he kept the, the sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as a relic, as a souvenir, as a remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And that is why Qatada radiallahu anhu, and in fact, when you look, when you study the Shama'il, you'll see that Qatada, he did a great service to the Ummah by asking all these questions to Anas ibn Malik due to Anas ibn Malik's closeness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Anas ibn Malik was known to have kept the uh, sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrated the sandal of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two ribbons, meaning uh, that kept the soles together, and two upper straps that separated the toes. Two upper straps that separated the toes. Hadith number 77, Isa ibn Tahman narrated Anas ibn Malik showed us a pair of sandals that had two straps and were hairless. Later on, Thabith told me that those were the sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is just reaffirming what I previously mentioned. Ubaid ibn Jurayj, uh, hadith number 78, Ubaid ibn Jurayj asked Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, why do you prefer wearing subti types of sandals? He replied, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wearing sandals that did not have hair on them, performing ablution while he had them on. This is why I like wearing them. This is why I like wearing them. So here we see uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma saying that the reason why he likes these particular sandals is because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself wore them. And what we learn over here that yes, while it is commendable to love everything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, it is not binding upon everyone. It is not binding upon everyone. And we'll see this in the last hadith of Uthman radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr and Umar had their sandals with two straps Yet Uthman radiallahu anhu had his sandal with one strap. And this shows us that there is room for preference. However, it is also praiseworthy to follow the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu did over here. Now, what does Sibti sandal mean? Sibti stand, sandal in this um, uh, hadith is referring to a sandal that is made of cow leather that has been tanned and the hair has been removed altogether. So it has been removed altogether so that there's no hair remaining. Now this is not something um, common in our day and age that whenever you buy leather sandals that you would find any hair on them. Most, I would say 99.9%, .9 if not 100% of the sandals that you buy in shoes that are made of real leather, they have had the hair removed from them altogether. Yet previously this was not the case. Sometimes you would buy leather that would still have hair remaining on them. And here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose the sandals that were hairless, that were tanned of cow leather. Hadith number 79, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu uh, related the sandals of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had two upper straps. So I want you to imagine if this is the sandal, then, sorry, let me just put the bookmark in. If this was the, the sandal, then there is a strap at the, at the bottom by the toes, and then there's a strap at the top. And this is to um, keep the foot in place. This is to keep in foot in place so that the foot does not slide uh, outside of the sandal, does not slide outside of the sandal or even inside the sandal itself. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is saying that the sandal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had uh, those two straps. Hadith number 80, Amr ibn Harith narrated, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praying um, while wearing a pair of sandals that had new souls sewn into them. So this shows us the permissibility of praying with your shoes and sandals on. This shows us the permissibility of praying with your shoes and sandals on. Now, let's give some disclaimers and let's uh, educate ourselves about this process. Number one, you should only pray with your shoes and sandals on if you are outside or if you are in a place that it is customary to wear shoes or if you're in a place that it is customary to wear shoes. So during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was customary to wear your sandals inside of the masjid. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seen wearing his sandals inside of the masjid in this hadith. Now, if it is not customary 
to wear sandals in the place that you're going to or your shoes where you're going to, then you should not pray in that area with your shoes on. Number two, a common question is, but we walk in all sorts of things. How about if there's impurity on our shoes or sandals? Now, if there's any impurity outside uh, on your shoe or sandal, regardless of in salah or not, you should remove it. You should remove it and make sure that there isn't any. However, the general rule in fiqh is that when you walk outside, the sand and the dust and the dirt that you walk through actually purify any impurities that you may have walked through. So for example, if you walked in urine and then you walked through the sand and you walked through the grass and you walked through all sorts of other uh, things, then all of that would purify the urine that you would have walked through. It would have purified the urine that you would have walked through. And that is uh, some of the basic fiqh pertaining to that. Now, please do not understand that I'm saying you should wear your shoes inside of the masjid and this is the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. No, that is not the case. It was customarily normal during the time of the Prophet wasallam to wear your shoes and sandals inside of the masjid and that is why he did so. That is why he did so. Hadith number 81. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, one should not wear one shoe and walk, either wear them both or remove them both. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is showing us that from the etiquettes of footwear is that both of your feet should be covered or neither of your feet should be covered or neither of your feet should be covered. And scholars have mentioned um, several reasons, several reasons. From them is that it creates uh, a disproportionate uh, pressure on one side of the body over the other, and this can be harmful. Number two, it is a walk that is not considered honorable. Number three is that it is a walk that draws attention to yourself. Number four, it is a walk that would cause people to talk about you, and that is not something that is uh, liked in the Sharia. Number five, uh, it will make you stick out. It will make you stick out. And this is just in general that you know, unless you have a medical reason or a valid reason to limp, you're not meant to limp. So these fake walks that people do, particularly in pop culture, those go against the teachings of Islam. They go against the teachings of Islam. So those are some of the reasons that the scholars mentioned that you should not walk with one shoe on, but rather you cover both of your feet or you cover neither of them. Hadith number 82 is the same. And we move on to hadith number 83. Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu narrated, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prohibited people from eating with the left hand and from wearing one sandal only. From wearing one sandal only. So here we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prohibited eating with the left hand. The majority of scholars have said that it is makruh, it is disliked to do so, and a minority have said that it is haram. But we have a clear hadith that states do not eat with your left hand for shaitan eats with his left hand. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that again, unless you have a valid reason, particularly a medical one, uh, that you cannot eat with your right hand, then um, you should try your utmost best to eat with your right hand uh, and drink with your right hand uh, as much as possible, as much as is possible. You do not want to fall into something haram uh, or even uh, as some scholars say makruh, um, just because of the, the, the basic fact that you don't want to do something that shaitan does. And then again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that you shouldn't wear one sandal, that you shouldn't wear one sandal. Hadith number 84, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam anhu narrated, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever one amongst you puts on their sandals, he should begin with the right, and when one of you removes them, the left one should be removed first. Let the right side be the first when putting them on and the, the last one when removing it. So here the Prophet Sallallahu is teaching us more etiquette in terms of our sandals, that when you put your sandals or shoes on, you put it on with the right foot first and then your left foot second. And then when you're removing the sandals or your shoes, you remove the left one first and the right one second. And now you may think that this is a trivial matter, but in reality, the Prophet Sallallahu did this intentionally. And anything that the Prophet Sallallahu did intentionally, we want to try to preserve and we want to try to teach our children as much as possible. So please, when you are teaching your children, teach them 
to put their right shoe on first and then their left shoe. And then when they're removing their shoes, remove the left one first and then the right one. This is a part of preserving our tradition. So please do so uh, and obviously implement it ourselves as much as possible. And this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam honoring the right side. And this is why hadith number 85 is exactly just that, that Aisha radiallahu anha narrated, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked to begin with the right side as much as possible. He began with the right side when he combed his hair, wore his shoes, washed his limbs when uh, performing ablution. And this shows us that the right side should be honored and that is done so in wearing one's shoes by putting on the right shoe first and taking off the right shoe last. So that is how the right side is honored. Number 86, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated, the sandals of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two upper straps and so did the sandals of Abu Bakr and Umar. However, Uthman ibn Affan was the first one to use one strap. And when he says he was the first one to use one strap, he means from the leaders of the Ummah. He means from the leaders of the Ummah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar all had two straps, yet Uthman Radallahu Anhu only had one strap. And this shows us that if there was any virtue or any sunnah uh, that could have been followed in having the two straps, Uthman Radallahu Anhu never would have left it. But the fact that it was a matter of preference showed us that Uthman radiallahu anhu showed his own personal preference to show its permissibility, to show its permissibility. And that brings us to the conclusion of chapter number 11. So now let us quickly recap what we've taken. In chapter number nine, we discussed the poverty that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam went through and how he used to eat and how the companions radiallahu anhum would go days without eating so much so that they would have epileptic seizures. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself would not know what food was in his house and if he did have it, he would share it with the poor companions. Also the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never ate till his fill, yet if he was invited to a gathering, he would eat up to two thirds of fill. He would eat up to two thirds of fill to show honor to his guest. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was gifted leather socks from a non-Muslim and he wore them without uh, questioning what the material was or if they were pure, teaching us that you can accept gifts from non-Muslims and then also things are pure until proven otherwise. And we also learned the fiqh of wiping over the socks that it is done over the top and not the bottom. And also if they are not leather socks, what you can do in that situation. And we also learned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given socks from a Muslim. And again, he did not question if they were from a uh, halal slaughtered source or not. Then we learned about the sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the different styles that he wore and some of the etiquettes pertaining to those sandals. Some of the etiquettes pertaining to those sandals, particularly putting on your right first and then making your right the last one that you take off. Inshallah, next Tuesday we will go to chapter number 12, which speaks about the ring of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we will speak about the different etiquettes pertaining to jewelry, the different etiquettes pertaining to jewelry that we can learn bithnillahi ta'ala. So that will be on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time or 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Montreal, New York, Toronto. Now, let's go back and give salams to people and answer questions because I know there were quite a few of them. So, Noel, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hiba, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shahnaz, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Iqbar, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, apa khabar. Triple B, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Lutfi, Lutfi, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um Qasim Mustafa, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahida Salom, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Islam promotes peace and brotherhood. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Triple B says, please, Sheikh, can a Muslim wipe her hijab if she has made ablution before she puts the hijab on, before she puts the hijab on? This is a very minority position that has been narrated in the books of fiqh. And the general ruling is that the hijab should not be wiped over. The general ruling is that the hijab should not be wiped over and that she should only use this concession if she's making wudu in public and she cannot uh, safely remove her hijab without being seen, 
then in that situation, she can exercise that opinion as uh, some of the madhahib have allowed it. But the general rule is that you should wipe your hair, even if it is just, uh, you know, uh, the front portion of it, uh, wiping over as much of it as you can. Uh, if that is what is able to, then that is better than wiping over the hijab. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. al ghuraba fi dunya wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. From Qatar, ahla wa sahlan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And then we have Lubna Ahmed. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khairan everyone for attending today. I, I hope and pray that it was of some benefit. And inshallah, I'll see all of you on Tuesday. Bidhin Allahi ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.